Okay, here we go. Stand by. Three, two, one, action. Assume nothing. Rash, bald face, blasphemy. Question everything. I find it extremely hard to imagine. Open your eyes. It is quite all right to be an atheist. The fastest growing group of people in the country has been measured as being those who have no belief or who are atheists. You don't have to be apologetic or quiet about it. Challenge the opposition. You see religion on a hundred fronts losing the argument. And start thinking. This is The Thinking Atheist Worldwide. We're doing the show a uh, day late because I'm still pouring through an inbox after a much-needed week-long vacation. You know, it's funny when you go on vacation and come back, there's this pile of stuff. (laughs) You just look at it and sometimes you think, I should have stayed. Um, We had a great time in Florida. You know, it's funny, I'm approaching tonight's show in a way that's somewhat uncomfortable to me. I normally try to do some measure of preparation. You've taken time out of your busy schedule, out of your lives, to join me for this, to this show and to spend the next 90 minutes or whatever with me. And, and I have a responsibility as host to put something together that is hopefully worth listening to. And I feel, I do, I feel sort of the responsibility of that. I need to make sure that I'm well prepared and that I have to have all of this stuff together. And then I've got, uh, I'm ready for a compelling guest or we're going to go through the switchboard and tackle these questions. And, and, you know, tonight I, (laughs) I'm just, I'm just going for it. If you are seeking kind of a structured thing, tonight is not your night. If you're seeking a show where Seth does not just ramble on to whatever comes out of his mouth, tonight is not your night. I myself am, am, I come back from vacation. I will say, you know, it was a much needed time for Natalie and me. I love what I do. I love the thinking atheist. I love it. I love this community. I love this family. I, I love making a difference or trying to make a difference. And... After four some years, I will admit to just being fried, just fried. And for a couple of reasons, it's not just the schedule. It's not just nonstop, the shows and the videos and the travel and all of this other stuff on top of the family and the job. It's a frustration with feeling sometimes like you may feel that we're not really making any headway out there. And what brings that to mind is when I continually fight the same fights over and over again. When I continue to hear the same responses, refutations, rebuttals, assertions, whatever, over and over again. A few weeks ago, I released a video called Intelligent Design, which takes a hard look at the quote-unquote poor design. If you're going to be one of those people who posts on Facebook, and I see them all the time, they'll go and see a rainbow or a beautiful sunset or a a mountain vista or something complex and wonderful or they're celebrating the birth of a beautiful child or some amazing things happen. And And the world and the universe is filled with wonder. There are plenty of opportunities for people to sort of get that warm fuzzy. But then they take the next step and they say, how can you look at this and say there is no God? That it is not absolutely part of a design, a divine plan. And I wanted to address some of the design that, quite frankly, isn't all that hot. And we just sort of dipped our toe in the ocean on the order of things that are not well designed. You know, we've been talking a lot about the spring tornado season and the same people who speak about the beautiful sunsets at night and the pretty rainbows have nothing to say when an F5 tornado blows through and destroys a town and kills children. When they see, you know, parasitic insects who climb onto a living host and plant eggs in in its brain And those larvae eat their way out of the host insect while it continues to be alive in the horribly hideous, painful, macabre scenario. Is that part of God's design? Are you kidding me? We talk about um, for every child that is born healthy, and we celebrate that. We have to talk about the uncomfortable topic of a child that is not born healthy, that is born deformed in some way, or stillborn, and the grieving that goes with the death of a child. 
You talk about disease, you know, at the microscopic level, there's uh, Stephen Meyer has a book called Signature in the Cell. God's signature is evident even at the molecular level. There can be no doubt of God's design. Well, all right, fine. Look, if you're going to go there, you're going to have to account for all of the stuff at the microscopic level that can kill you or ruin your day. And I'm reading the comments section on the YouTube page. And it's complexity. It's the Bible tells me so. Or one of my favorites is, it's a fallen world. Which is a huge cop-out. right? God gets credit for the pretty rainbows. But for the death of a child, it's our fault. In this battered spouse mentality that is rampant in the church. It's our fault. We were born broken. Adam sinned. Eve sinned. We should apologize for our entire lives. That's just exasperating. Christopher Hitchens was right. This is the wish to be a slave. I didn't see it that way when I was a believer. You know, there was a Christian band called Plum that had a song called God Shaped Hole. There's a God Shaped Hole in all of us. And that's the thinking. We are all created with a void inside of us. And we are designed so that God comes and fills the void. All right. You complete me. That kind of a thing. So I am born and I am a vessel for him to inhabit and to then complete me and to be all the things that I cannot be. You heard the podcast I did three weeks ago with my former boss, David Stevens, my KXOJ radio boss. By the way, I've received more emails on that particular show than any in recent memory. And almost everybody said, please do not have him on the radio again. I know it was frustrating. (laughs) And the problem with that conversation was this. He spoke like a slave. Yeah, and I genuinely, I th- I'm convinced he's an absolute believer. I know, he's, I know he's a good man. But he is of the mentality that who he is, his true character, is only evident at his worst moment. Otherwise, we're all running for office. When you go out and you meet someone for the first time, it's like going on a first date. You're obviously running for office a little bit. You're going to show them your best side. You're impeccably kept. You're, you're well-spoken. You're saying the right things. You're, I get that. But the mentality that he was bringing to the table was, when I am at my worst, when I totally fall off the wagon, when I say the wrong thing, when I'm ugly on the inside to someone, well, that's my true condition. That's a revelation of who I am at my core. Well, how sad is that? I can't necessarily love my wife the way I need to love my wife. I need my invisible friend to give me the power. He comes and inhabits me. And now I'm able to... Well, wait a minute. Maybe you love her because she's lovable. And because you are compatible. And because you've invested your life together. And because you've made a commitment. Maybe you're giving yourself not nearly enough credit. Maybe you're doing all the heavy lifting. Maybe, maybe your love is part of a natural order, right? It's a natural phenomenon. It's explainable. I got an email from my own mother right before I left for uh, for Florida. I mean, right, right when I left. Uh, People come at me from different... I'm, I'm just going on. You guys are my bartender tonight, okay? Just... Everybody have a seat, and here's a cold one, and let's talk, okay? Or would you just listen for a few? I need somebody to listen. (laughs) People come at me from different angles, right? It's like they're testing the walls of of a fortress, and they're seeing where the weaknesses are. So at one point, they come at you, and, and they play the personal experience card. Look, I know this happened. I know it happened, and I know that through sheer enthusiasm and verb, I can convince you that it happened. So that doesn't work. So then they come over to the other side of the wall and they threaten you with hell. Oh, yeah, you do not want to get this thing wrong because hell is real, man, and you'll cook forever. Look, play it safe, even if you're not sure. That doesn't work because I don't see that as true conviction, right? You're just playing poker. You don't really know what hand you got. So they go to another wall. You've just been wounded. Something happened to you in your life. And, you know, I feel the heartbreak within you, Seth. And I want you to know that God loves you. 
and he wants to heal what it is. So now I'm broken. Now I'm operating from a position that I am damaged, and that is altering my perception. Well, that doesn't work because I have a pretty clear view into my own life, and it just doesn't wash. I've got a wonderful life, and I'm surrounded by love, and I'm, I wouldn't go back. Then they play the condescension card. Everybody knows there's a God. I mean, what, what, if you want to walk away from God, I mean, you can, but you're totally in the minority. I mean, evolution's been laughed out of the scientific community. Very, very few legitimate scientists hold to evolution by natural selection, and they admit that history is proven by the scriptures, and the scriptures prove history, and it's all confirmed, and prophecies have come true. I mean, everybody knows you can take the minority position and be a laughingstock if you want. That doesn't work. They come back with something that could be a near-death experience. Proof of Noah's Ark. Are you kidding me? Somebody invoked the Creation Museum. The Creation Museum proves... <laughs> Wait a minute! And these people know I've not only toured the museum, but produced a 12-minute video on the experience. It's like I'm talking to a brick wall. Don't you ever feel that? Is anybody listening? You know, Dale McGowan, I'll say it again, had a great line in his speech at Free OK about people's desire to believe being greater than their desire to know. Most people have a greater desire to believe than they have to know. We looked at these textbooks that are being used in Louisiana to prove that dinosaurs and human beings coexisted. Because look, it's the Loch Ness Monster, and the Loch Ness Monster happens to be a plesiosaur. I'm sorry, they're teaching this to young children as science in a private Christian school. It's child abuse. I have to sit back and be a witness to young kids on my own family tree going and giving their public profession of faith to Jesus and being baptized. And I just sit back and watch. I mean, it's not my, they're not my kids. And I look at these kids and I think, God, they never had a chance. Surrounded by people who believe that they came from a, a magical garden. And that's their normal. And they're going to grow up hamstrung in an age where information is not quickly enough, but in short order, hopefully in the next couple of decades, we'll just relegate all of this prehistoric primitive nonsense to the punchline category. I get an email from mom and it's essentially... You can either devote your life to love or to hate, and both are supernatural concepts. So immediately now, the assertion is, if you are on the wrong side of the supernatural argument, you cannot either properly give or receive love, or you are predisposed more to hate. I mean, essentially, that's what it's saying, right? <laughs> Wait a minute. It's another tactic, testing another wall. And they didn't find Noah's Ark on a mountain in Turkey. You and apes do have common ancestry. Yes, you do. You are a higher primate. I know you feel insulted by this. I know my granddaddy wasn't no monkey. Mm -mm. Mm -mm. No, I was given dominion over the earth. I was created a person. Evolution's just a theory, by the way. Just a theory means that means it's just somebody's throwing shit up against the wall. And it, that's one of them things that stuck, but it, it hadn't been proven. You're kidding me. Have you looked at the definition of the word theory in the scientific context? No. The God of the gaps. Somebody explain what happened between here and here. It had to have been God. He just connects everything. You know, it takes more faith for you to be an atheist. I don't have enough faith to be an atheist. Mm-mm. No, that's why I believe that a guy gave birth to himself 2,000 years ago so that he could have himself killed by the very people he came to rescue so that he could rescue us from the very hell that he created. I'm a counterfeit. You know, if Seth was ever a true Christian, there's no way he would have ever walked away from any of this. Mm -mm. No, he's, you know, he must not have done it. Were you there? At Eastwood Baptist Church when I was nine years old and went forward and emphatically said the salvation prayer and believed with all of my heart Jesus Christ had come into my life to rescue me 
from myself, right? I was born a sinner, deserving of hell. That's how broken we are, kids. We deserve an eternal torture for something somebody else did. An innocuous act, by the way. Adam and Eve didn't go out and rape and pillage and kill and commit genocide. They didn't torture babies. They didn't do any of the stuff. That, no, they ate a piece of fruit, and in doing so, created a scenario where we deserve to be tortured forever. How Screwed up is that. I draw a big circle around the problems with Scripture. This doesn't agree with itself. This is hugely contradictory. This is just ridiculous. Well, you took it out of context. In what context does a 969-year-old human being make sense to you? In what context does Balaam's donkey make sense to you? In what context does the plunging of swords into the beating hearts of babies make sense to you? Your personal experience is absolutely unimpressive to me. I just know what happened is not proof. God, for everybody saying it about Jesus Christ or somebody else saying it about Allah, or there's somebody else saying they were abducted by aliens. I just know what happened. Well, well great. That and about four bucks will buy you a cup of coffee at Starbucks. The human eye is too complex to have evolved. I've been hearing that for four some years. Five years? They have computer models that show how it could evolve. They show the stages of evolved eyes in nature. Photosensitive cells. The primitive eye. The complex eye. You go to some of these creation websites, they parade out these PhD types who say that I'm here to give credibility to the God argument, right? I stand upon the Bible. How can somebody stand on the Bible and then be taken seriously in the halls of legitimate science? its I mean, I get the compartmentalization. I get what happens in the brain. I get that many, 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 many hugely intelligent people also believe in the talking snake. I get it. We're talking to Shermer about it on one of our podcasts. It's often not about intelligence. The desire to believe is just simply greater than the desire to know. Maybe it's the power of childhood indoctrination. Maybe something else is in play. Shermer's got a great book on it, by the way. Michael Shermer, The Believing Brain. Really good. Your belief system does not deserve respect just because it makes you happy. Why can't you just respect my belief? Well, I can respect your right to hold a belief. I totally do. You have a right to believe in whatever. You believe the universe was created by a giant, plush, pink, monkey suction cup to the back of one of Jupiter's moons. Fine. I respect your right to hold the belief. I don't have to respect the belief. Why do you get a pass? Why can you walk in a room and say the Earth is flat and automatically I'm required to respect it? It's bogus. And in the age of information, in the age of Google, in the age when you can go into any encyclopedic library, when you can go into many university courses online in a matter of moments and check everything out, you should prepare yourself for the white-hot light of scrutiny that will shine down upon this ridiculous assertion. It's coming. Trust me. If I have to hear one more time that our founding fathers here in the United States of America were all Christians and founded a Christian nation, I'm going to put my head through a wall. When I was in Christian school, they taught it to us so strongly that they incorporated the American flag into much of what we did. You know, we set our pledges to the flags, right, the American flag, but we also set our pledge to the Christian flag and to the Bible. When we had questions at Temple Christian School when I was in fourth grade, we had what was called the PACE system, where we sat in these little cubicles. If you had a question in your little cubicle, you didn't raise your hand. You had a little American flag, and you stuck it in this little post up here, and that flag was up until one of the monitors, a.k.a. teachers, came by to help you with your question. American flags were everywhere. God and country, God and country, God and country. Geez, they practically painted Benjamin Franklin and Thomas Jefferson and John Adams holding a Bible. So now here in the year 20 or 13, you will raise your hand and say, well, actually, no. Thomas Jefferson was a deist at best. Franklin didn't believe. John Adams didn't believe in, in the Christian God. Have you heard of the Treaty of Tripoli? What? 
The government is in no sense founded upon the Christian religion. It doesn't make any difference. I don't care what you say. When someone says to me, I don't care what evidence you bring to the table, I'll never give up my belief in God. Are we wasting our time? Doesn't make any difference what you say. Well, wait a minute. If I could bring you true information, stuff that is verifiable, correct information, wouldn't you want to know that? Aren't you curious? Doesn't truth matter? Doesn't matter what you say. Mm Mm-mm. They say there's no atheist in foxholes. Well, they don't see the mountain of emails I get from men and women in the armed services worldwide who are non-believers in any god. They play the Hitler card. (laughs) Hitler. Yeah, the reason Hitler killed so many Jews was because he was a believer in evolution. No. God, it doesn't even wash. Charles Darwin got saved on his deathbed. No. There are no transitional fossils. No. Hey, prove he doesn't exist. That's not even an argument. You can't prove he doesn't exist? Well, that's not how we start. I was speaking in uh, Clearwater, Florida last week. We had a great time. I mean, it was just so much fun. We were at the uh, Unitarian Universalist of uh, Clearwater, And they have an auditorium called the Octagon, which I'm going to try to get some pictures from that night. I wasn't able to take very many myself, but you're on an amphitheater type floor with a podium. And then the seats sort of rocket up all around you and on eight sides, hence the name Octagon. And they were just precious people. And we had a great time, brought out a presentation. We did some Q&A and somebody was asking about what can we do about the whole angry atheist thing? How can we focus less on anger? And I said, well, actually, anger is sometimes a legitimate response. You know, I'm angry at the targeting and indoctrination of children. Scaring kids with hell. It just makes my blood boil. I'm tired of watching politicians play God like a chess piece to get votes in a largely ignorant electorate. Faith. Family. Candidate X believes in God and America. (sighs) I'm angry that schools are teaching falsehoods, known falsehoods, and passing it off as fact. I'm angry that I'm surrounded by people who continue to paw at me to tell me that because I don't believe in fairies... I don't believe in Santa Claus. I don't believe in the Tooth Fairy. I don't believe in Jesus Christ. I don't believe in the writings of goat-sacrificing Iron Age primitives in the age of modern science, modern medicine, modern anything, that I'm the problem. I'm tired of churches on every corner preaching that gays are simply in disobedience to God. Many of them have, like, gay recovery courses. We'll pray the gay right out of you. I was at a church years ago, and they had a video about a guy who was a homosexual, right? He was, quote-unquote, a homosexual. Realized that he was in disobedience to God. He had allowed Satan a foothold in his life. His life was off the rails. He was broken. He needed to be fixed. And look, the church is right there waiting for him. So they bring him into a recovery program and they fill him full of the Bible and they talk about how it's a man and a woman, it's Adam and Eve, not Adam and Steve. And before you know it, after several months, he is now a heterosexual and he makes a promotional video. And he talks about his journey out of homosexuality and how much happier he is. And everybody in the auditorium nods and smiles and says, Amen. Someone else rescued. How little does the church know about sexuality? It's profound how ignorant the church is about sexuality and telling an entire culture of people that it's broken, it's in disobedience, it's going to hell because it doesn't fit into what? Some tremendously narrow biblical construct for sexuality. Well, God, I hope you don't use the scriptures for your idea of healthy sex. You see Pat Robertson on television? This guy, he's a gold mine. Let me look it up real quick.
He told one woman who'd sent a letter into the email bag that that the reason her husband cheated was because she wasn't providing a wonderful enough home. He believes that Haiti had an earthquake because Haiti had made a pact with the devil. <laughs> he believes that Gay Day at Disney World is going to cause Orlando to be hit by a hurricane. Here's what he said. He said that killing someone in a video game is the same as killing someone in real life. Murder committed in video games is no different than murder in the real world. He's also said that feminism, or the women's rights movement, encourages women to leave their husbands, kill their kids, and practice witchcraft. He said you should cast demons out of evil, infected, secondhand clothes. You know, you get a sweater... You get it at a garage sale, you sense some evil on it. You never know who's worn it. What if they were playing with a Ouija board or something? Well, that stuff sticks. Better cast those demons out, just in case, even if you're not sure. He believes Satan is a tool of God's love. God uses Satan to demonstrate himself. How screwed up is that? It's the same mentality that says that God allows natural disasters so that he can come in and give comfort and be the hero. He blames abortionists, feminists, gays, lesbians, and the ACLU for the attacks of 9-11. He believes Episcopalians, Presbyterians, and the Methodists have the spirit of the Antichrist. Keep them coming, Pat. You're better than late-night cable, pal. Hugely entertaining stuff every time he opens his mouth. How old is he now anyway? He's been on, I remember back when he ran for president. Can you imagine having President Pat Robertson? <laughs> He's the one who thinks that women are not interested in sex because, you know, it's a male thing, right? I think they were talking in the context of pornography and erotic fiction. And, oh, women don't do that. No, no, no. Women just wait around the house barefoot and pregnant. And the reason they got pregnant is because the man was interested in sex, and she's just available. After all, according to Pat Robertson and the scriptures, the woman must be subservient to the man. She must follow his lead. He's the final say. I was talking to a female friend of mine who uh, we were having a debate about God, brought up the Bible's perspective on women. Women, shut your mouth. Be silent in the churches. If you have something to say, go home, tell your husband. You can't tell us. Go tell your husband. Let him represent. You're not qualified. She did the same thing. You know what? I, I don't really want the big decisions in my life. No, I mean, I don't feel like I'm wired to, to you know, I'm, I'm more than happy to defer, to let my husband handle all that stuff. I just take care of the kids, do my thing. What a huge waste of potential to surrender yourself, to surrender your own value. Why would you need to gain your worth from a man? You know, how about a 50-50 partner? You know, you fall in love with whoever and you create a partnership where you discuss and connect and make life decisions together and you go through the ups and downs and you you figure it out together. But this whole thing where he's the final word because he's got a penis, I just don't get it. Ah, oh, you got a penis. <laughs> I guess the argument's over. Good night. I just, you know, I came back from vacation and I was so glad to, to uh, have spent that time in Florida. We went to a place called Anna Maria Island. And it's not too touristy. It's touristy, but it's not too touristy. And it was just a way to get out, get out of town. And they're big on the sunset there. They've got an amazing beach called Manatee Beach. And we would pull the... Uh, beach chairs out and we would sit back and wait for the sunset so we're sitting out there we're waiting for the sunset and all of a sudden i hear one of the loudest voices i've ever heard in my adult life guy must have been 50 feet from me and it was like he was screaming in my ear what happened was there was a woman her skin looked like she had been in the sun for a decade and she looked ragged and rough and disheveled and destitute. That's difficult to really know. You're just looking and getting an impression. I just happened to turn around 
And she walks up, and I guess she's trolling the beach asking people for money. Money for what? I don't know. Money to live, money to eat, money for a hotel, money for drugs, I don't know. But she happened upon one of the loudest proponents for Jesus I think I've ever heard. I was unbelievable. I'm sitting back. We're, Natalie and I are just trying to enjoy the sunset. <laughs> I'm on vacation. Why do I have to listen to this? Man? You should have heard the guy. You can't, you know, you don't have the ability to, to put your life together. And I'll give you some money tonight, but I'll tell you what, I'm giving you my time and my wisdom right now. I've got a lot of life experience, and i tell you what, Jesus loves you. Jesus is the solution to your problems. Now, this woman has some significant problems, obviously. I don't know what they are, but it's obvious she's come from some pretty dark places. And this guy is telling her that she does not have the power to overcome these problems herself. She's not able to rely on life choices or even her fellow human beings to get out of it. She has to rely on Sky Jesus. And he's sitting back there pacing. He was pacing so much, he actually paced a like a flat portion onto the sand, onto the beach. He was just kind of walking in this square. <laughs> and she's just standing there. Now I get the vibe. She's listening to his song and dance because she wants the money. How long do I have to listen to this before he gives me 20 bucks? They must have gone on for 45. I mean, it was unbelievable. It just what I almost got up and walked up to her and said, Lady, look, I've met some people who are more full of shit than this guy in my life, but not many. But I, I was, I'm on vacation. I didn't come here to debate. I just want to relax. I almost picked up my chairs and just moved down the beach. He's given this lady the line that she does not have the power. She does not have the ability. She essentially isn't responsible for her own life choices and decisions and all the things that happen to her. And she is going to have to drop to her knees and beg the help of an invisible friend. How much real help did he give her? Zippo. Oh, I don't want to be that. You know, I do not want to be that guy. I do not want to be that guy who's just exasperated all the time. And I take a lot of real encouragement from the occasional messages we'll get on Facebook or via email or even in the YouTube comments section, I mean, wherever, wherever they come, where someone says they were encouraged or they went through a time where they felt like they were alone and they, you know, or they had questions and, and something helped them, you know, and, and I, you know, you feel like that it, somebody out there is listening, somebody's benefiting, somebody's being encouraged. I was at the event at Clearwater. You should have seen these people. They came up and they each had a story about how the site and shows helped them. And, and I need that. I'm not, I will tell you absolutely, I feed off of that. It keeps me sane because otherwise I feel like I'm having the same 15 arguments over and over and nobody's listening. You know, you look at the William Lane Craigs and the Ken Hams and the Kent Hovens and the Eric Hovens and the, all of these people, and you see all the crap they're throwing out. They haven't given us anything new. Anything new. The Bible tells me so, so it's true. God gave me the kiss of knowledge, so that's all I require. I have the guiding of the Holy Spirit, so now the Bible does make sense. Now I have enlightenment. Forty minutes. Have I said anything at all to you? <laughs> I feel like I should just apologize. <laughs> but I want to feel like we're making a dent. And I and look, I know this is right now. This is just a, this is just somebody bitching and moaning. Look, I know the difference is being made. I know that you and I are seeing a difference made out there. I know that we are encouraging some people who got to that point where they're like, "This just doesn't make sense. This just doesn't make sense." This just doesn't make sense, but I'm afraid, or I, I don't know if anybody else is having the same questions. And, and then they come across, a, you know, it could be any, it could be the atheist experience, it could be talk origins, it could be infidels.org, it could be any site or, or show or whatever, the you know, American Atheist website, I don't know, wherever. They see Silverman on Fox News and they go, hey, wait a minute, he makes sense. You know, I, I know that there are some people out there who are benefiting but I'm right now. It's just sheer. Just I, I'm tired of having to deal with the same crap over and over. 
I'm tired of the discrimination. I'm tired of the division. I'm tired of hate being passed off as love. Oh, I only reject you because it's tough love and Jesus wants me to. Now, we love gay people, but we hate the sin. And we don't want gay people in our lives, kids. By the way, they're tainted by Satan. They take these people and they put them off in these little pods where they can spend years of their lives, decades of their lives, completely unchallenged, and then they grow up and vote. They grow up and impact policy. They go up and build the radio station, you know, the audiences of these talk radio stations, (laughs) you know, operating with absolute falsehoods as their foundation, and they don't care that it's long been refuted and addressed and debunked or whatever. I'm done bitching, and I'm going to let you do some talking. Area code 480. You're on the Thinking Atheist radio podcast. Who's this? Hey, Seth. How you doing? I'm doing well. What's happening with you? Who's this? Yeah, this is Carlo. I'm calling back in again. What's going on? Just wanted to, you know, I, I heard you, you know, feeling beat down about, uh, you know, all these people, you know, bringing up the same old arguments again. And honestly, I mean, I feel the same way. I, I hear all that stuff all the time. I honestly think they're just preaching to themselves. Even though they're talking to you, they're just preaching to themselves. They want to convince themselves because they're, you know, they're, they're just terrified. They're terrified of the unknown. They're terrified of dying, and they just need this. They need this God pacifier to make them feel good. You think it's because of doubt? You know I mean? Do you think they secretly doubt, and so now they're trying to I, convince themselves? I think it's, I mean, it's just like you were saying about, you know, they live in these, like, like I said, they call them a, you call it a pod, uh, John Stewart called it bullshit mountain. Um, <laughs> Bill, Bill Mark, Bill. I'm making yeah. a note of that. Hang on. Hey, bull, bullshit. Well populated area, by the way, bullshit mountain has a lot of residents apparently. So I'm sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. If you ever get a, oh, just on the subject of that, if you ever get a chance, check out uh, John Stewart in his debate with Bill O'Reilly last fall and see it on YouTube where he talks about bullshit now and more. But yeah, I mean, they just live in this isolated little world, and they, like you said, I mean, there's there's a whole echo chamber of that stuff in the church. I mean, it's um, how could evolution be true because I've never seen a crocodile, and it just echoes there, and they think that like you know. <laughs> Every scientist in Harvard, Yale, Dartmouth, um, Berkeley, all these places that they've never heard this message, that they've never heard that. And, and, and they think that, you know, if you talk to Richard Dawkins, he's going to go, oh, I never thought of it that way. Gee, you're right. There are crocodiles. So evolution must be true. Or um, evolution must not be true. And it, it's just such a shock. And I think when they finally meet people that are rational, it shakes their world and makes them go, you know, holy cow, what's going on? So they have to, you know, double this up. They go back to their church leaders, and, you know, they feel like they're so shot down. So they go, I, I think things like the Creation Museum, that's all built for fundamentalist Christians. It's not built to educate the unenlightened world. Isn't Kirk Cameron coming out with uh, a film? Let's see, it's called unstoppable and it's an evangelical film and of course every time kirk cameron and ray comfort open their mouths the rest of us literally drive our vehicles into a ditch like end the madness (laughs) you know to make it stop every time they open their mouth they sink into an even bigger swamp of dumb i do not understand and you know it's like when um they unveil the atheist monument in florida and Eric Hovind and Cy Tim Bruggenkate show up at the atheist event to raise hell and stand. They actually physically stand on the monument. And, and I don't know if they're talking about hell or whatever. They're doing, but they're, my, part of me has to think, do they really buy this? Or is it just about, here I am, look at me, hear my voice, I'm somebody. I don't know. I, I don't know what drives all of that. I think they're driven by the numbers. I think that they're driven by how many souls can I convert? And, you know, I'm willing to do anything. I'll make the biggest ass out of myself to get the numbers. It's like a, it's like a cosmic Jerry Lewis Labor Day telethon. You know, I, I don't know how else to describe it. They just, they just want to find as many lost souls as they can and convert them, and they don't care how they have to do that. Yeah. At least I, that's what I think drives people like uh, Eric Hoven. As for the other ones, I can't, uh, 
I, you feel I, the I, pr- I you feel the frustration, right? I think we all have this oh. shared frustration. We're all at this moment leaning on each other, going, "It's going to be okay, pal. Just hang in there. Just one more person to tell you that, that hey, it's better to believe in God and be wrong." Uh, one other person to say that you can't get something from nothing. Someone else says, what caused the Big Bang? Or why would it be so popular? Why would there be so many copies of the Bible if it wasn't true? Just hang in there because one day all of this fighting the same 15 arguments is one day going to make a difference. I feel like we're a support group, <laughs> you know? <laughs> like, it's yeah, okay, exactly. man. I don't know. Did you ever watch The Simpsons? Were you ever a fan of The Simpsons? I didn't watch a lot of The Simpsons, no. There's an old episode that probably aired like 10 or 15 years ago, but it was one where uh, Milhouse, who's this nerdy little blue-haired kid who uh, has a crush on Lisa, he gets lost and the whole town's out looking for him. And Bart goes, you know, if I was Milhouse, where would I be? Then it cuts to a scene of the Spirograph factory, which is like this run-down building at the edge of town nobody visits anymore. And he goes inside and there's one little employee still toiling away. And... Um, Bart asks him where Millhouse is, and he says, I don't know. And then he says, did you know that there was a, you know, a corresponding increase in crime to the decline of Spirograph use? And Bart goes, oh, great, thanks, bye. <laughs> and I see it was like the creationist or the same thing as a little guy in the Spirograph factory. Yeah. They're just toiling away at this pathetic delusion and not realizing the rest of the world is just leaving them behind. I don't think their protests are going to get quieter. I think it's going to become more intense. They're going to become more emphatic. I think it will become more and more of a desperate cry, join our ranks. Did you see that article from, um, you know what, I posted it on Facebook. Let me take a look at it real quick. It was an article by the, is it the Institute for Creation Research? And they were encouraging people to go and get their degree in the sciences before they lose an opportunity to become a scientist because they will be laughed out of the scientific community for believing in in God. Wanted young creation scientist, and they actually say at the bottom of the article, for those who do have an interest in science, we wish to offer a few words of advice. Work hard to get the best possible grades. Push yourself, blah, blah, blah. Now check this out. Although you should not right. be dishonest about what you believe, it, it's probably prudent not to draw attention to your creationist beliefs while you're a student, particularly if you're in a field that directly touches upon the origins controversy, such as paleontology, biology, or geology. Given the increasing anti-Christian sentiment in society and the academic persecution in the secular universities, there may very well come a day when it will no longer be possible for a Bible-believing Christian to get an advanced degree in the natural sciences. And part of me is like, look, if you're going into the scientific community to prove Jesus, you're not really a scientist. You're an evangelical, right? Right. And so, in other words, just become a little mole and try and plant yourself. It's been part of their whole, you know, the whole, um, was it Discovery Institute or Philip Johnson's whole wedge um, philosophy of attacking evolution and the natural sciences in order to get creationism taught again. I mean, they want to plant moles and they... They see science as something they just can't be. I mean, they can't win from a rational argument that evolution isn't true because my uh, holy book says that dirt man and rib woman existed, and therefore it can't be true. You can't. You just can't win with that. Yeah. You do that in academia. Not only will they laugh you out, but that's the you know that's the end of your career. So the whole thing is they have to plant you inside it and try and tear it down from within. Yeah. Awesome, dude. I do appreciate the call and and for the encouragement and keep listening. All right, my friend. All right, we'll do. You guys have a good day. All right, take it easy. Sometimes I am chastised for mocking religious teachings. I take a special joy and pleasure in mocking the religion of my youth. I say my youth. (laughs) Of my formative years and my early adult years. And the reason I do is not because I'm trying to piss off the religious. It's not my end zone. I I honestly think sometimes if it is ridiculous, the appropriate response is to treat it with ridicule. And for those of us who have been controlled at some point in our lives by these harmful teachings, and they are harmful teachings, it's cathartic to be able to just stop and laugh at it all. It's healthy. I put up a picture of Jesus water skiing behind a speedboat or something. It's 
It's sacrilege in the eyes of some to me. It's awesome. Can never post too much Jesus out there. Jesus doing this, Jesus doing that. Remember that Top Gear episode where they showed the manger and it was the Stig with his white helmet and white white, white fire suit on in the manger? You know, that that's awesome. Disco Jesus, he died for your spins. The last stripper Jesus, did you see the one where they had the stripper pole on the uh, on the last supper table? That's just awesome. Oh, you're offen- you're you you're doing more damage than good out there. You're just offending people. Well, you know whether or not somebody's offended is not the primary question. I'm not saying we should not act with others in mind. I'm not saying that we should go out and just throw caution to the wind and be as offensive as we can possibly be. But quite frankly, Stephen Fry was right. If you're offended, so what? Your level of offense has more to say about you than it has to say about me. If I show up and I make a Jesus joke at a party and you get pissed off, it tells me, number one, you're not in control of your own emotions, and two, you don't think Jesus can stand up for himself. He's Jesus. He's got it. He does not require your backup. <laughs> just, you, know, you know, we posted some stuff about the Pope back when the Pope was... Uh, what do they say? Elected, appointed, whatever. I mean, the Pope's a wonderful target. The whole Catholic Church with the costumes and the Pope mobile and the white smoke and the black smoke and, and the tremendous litany of scandals that have just permeated the church. I mean, it is ripe for mockery. People flip out. There are millions upon millions of Catholics on the planet. You're offending them. So what? Let them see some sacred cows roasted over an open flame. It is healthy. They will also see the lightning does not flash out of the sky and fry my ass. Area code 937. You're on the Thinking Atheist radio podcast. Who's this? Uh, Mike. Mike, thanks for calling the show. What's up? How much? Uh, first time I've been able to listen live. Normally out at a... Uh atheist meetup group at a bar on Tuesday nights. Better place to be than sitting behind a radio, man. That's awesome. <laughs> but I'm glad you called the show tonight. What's going on? Uh, going with uh, broken record stuff and the creation evolution debate. I wanted to cross a, a book in the university library one time that was on this. And all of the arguments that were in there from like the 60s and 70s are the exact same arguments that they use nowadays. The same and, stuff is just being recirculated. Yeah. Pretty much no changes at all. So, are you with Carlos and me? Are you, and probably the thousands of other listeners, do you feel that sense of, I'm going to put my head through a brick wall frustration at the fact that we continue to encounter the types of arguments that should have been relegated to the history books that should be completely off the shelf? We should have moved on by now, don't you think? Yeah, I can't understand why so many people don't go with what we can see and what we can know. Probably a host of reasons why. I think indoctrination is powerful. I think uh, I think the church is very attractive in many ways. You know, it, it does provide comfort and security and community and family and purpose. It alleviates the fear of death. People feel like when they die, they're going to go and be reunited with the family dog. And every, I mean, I understand why. But when did we become more interested in comfort than we than we are in truth? You know. Yeah, I don't know. All right. Anything else? Uh, no, that's about it. All right. Thanks for calling the show. Much appreciated. Area code seven seven zero. You're on the Thinking Atheist Radio podcast. Who's this? Uh, this is Alicia. Hi, Seth. What do you have for us today? I'm so glad you mentioned your creationist museum video because I've actually just discovered you under a month ago, and I love your stuff. I'm a newly out atheist, so to speak, in Georgia, in Dallas, Georgia, and it's I'm like the only one here. <laughs> and so it's really wonderful to to see like minded people on YouTube. But um when I went to your creationist museum video, there was someone there basically <laughs> saying that, oh man, this video was just about a bunch of atheists complaining and, you know, I'm not afraid of science and uh, you know, evolution and, and God aren't mutually exclusive. And I, I, I wrote a comment, basically, that was like, "Hun, if you could show me God creating a bee, a flower, a river, then I'll believe in your God. But you don't have anything but apologies arguments. 
basically. And so she says, does the Bible say humans exist, that the sun exists, that the world exists? Well, there you go. Yeah, the Bible tells and, me uh, so. Yeah, I hear it all yeah, the time. Yeah, exactly. And I was so frustrated because I had just gotten out of another uh, YouTube stream where someone had said, well, you know, atheists and uh, theists are just going to go at it because neither side has really good evidence. And, and I was like, wait a minute, no, that's not true. Atheists have a ton of really concrete evidence for what they believe, whereas theists, uh, you know, atheists consist of esoteric type of things like feelings and, you know, and, and, and ancient books that don't make sense. <laughs> And it, and it does get frustrating. And that's why I'm glad we have an atheist community and people like you. Because if it weren't for people like you, I feel so isolated. You, you do such a, I, I just have to send you a virtual hug. Well, <laughs> uh, I receive that hug and I give it back. I, I, in Georgia, it's got to be rough. It's got to be rough, you know. It's, it's I, very rough. I, I, I joke, but it's sort of not a joke, that if I mention I'm atheist, I might get lynched. And I'm, I mean... And I'm a gun toter myself, but there's a lot of people around me with guns. <laughs> so I keep to myself. And I don't say, I mean, I get preached at myself, but I try not to wear the big A on my sleeve. Um, yeah, you just, you it's, are it's who difficult. you are, right? You just want to be who you are. Everybody else gets carte blanche yeah. to be able to be who they are. Somehow you are treated with a, a separate set of rules. They also, for some reason, believe that the burden of proof is on the non-believer. Sagan was right. Extraordinary claims do require extraordinary evidence. If you're going to come to me and tell me this hugely elaborate mythology, you're going to have to bring some crazy evidence to back it up. There's a video, uh, and I don't know if you've heard of it, called The, the Thaw. Have you heard of it? The Thaw? The no, I haven't seen thaw. it. And if you get a chance, I was like, this would be so great for Seth parody. It's, it's got a bunch of really young kids. I mean, and that's the floor of what it is talking about how Christian rights are being taken away and asking questions like, why can't I pray in schools? Or why do I have to check God at the door? I have seen it. When are we going to Christ? Have you seen it? I that? have seen this That's video. It. Yes. It's... And I'm sitting there like, why? And they're hiding behind kids. I think that's what makes me more angry than anything, is they're using these young kids to say this stuff. And I'm yeah. like, that. That's, and they don't, of course, they don't have, you can't make comments or rate it or anything. I'm amazed at the amount of theist pages that disable comments right off the bat. By the way, if I'm going to be honest with you, I haven't seen the film. I just saw the trailer. Uh, there's a trailer out for yeah. the thaw. And it's very much a victim. We're persecuted. We're being suppressed, repressed. Our rights are being stripped away. And I'm, I'm looking around at this hugely religious culture we live in and going, your rights aren't being stripped away at all. Well, and I just wanted to scream when the first girl says, why can't we pray in school? I'm like, you can. Of you, course you can. You can pray in school. You just can't do it over the loudspeaker. The school cannot sanction or endorse it on state yeah. time or with state funds. They can't, do relig they can't promote any specific religion. Quite frankly, it irritates me when the believers say that they should have school-mandated prayer because if they allow that, now we're praying to any and every God that comes along, right? They're not just going to get prayers for Jesus. Everybody else and in the religion category gets a seat at that table. Well, how jacked up is that going to be? And to give you an idea of climate, I was at my dermatologist and a lady was getting me prepared to see the doctor. And we were talking about different things, and I was saying how, you know, I question the universe. I question everything. I believe it's good to question. She's a Catholic. And I said, and I think she took what I meant because I said I don't know as me being agnostic. Mm -hmm. She said, oh, you sound like such a humble person. I mean, I mean, it's better than just being an all-out atheist. And I just well, chuckled, and I didn't correct her. Yeah, Maybe whatever. I should have. Whatever. But, you know, I don't get hung up too much on the label. I use atheist because, quite frankly, I... I don't say that there is no God. I say that I don't see any evidence to support the notion of God. Therefore, I do not believe in a God. I don't hold to a God. I am an atheist, a non-theist, but whatever, whatever they call you. The truth is, you're awesome for being a non-believer, for being a skeptic in Georgia, in such a hugely a religious skeptic, community. You're awesome. Skeptic. You're awesome. Think about it. I'm a black skeptic in Georgia where Dr. Martin Luther King walked down the street. So when I meet other black uh, Christians... They look at me like, er, like, like it's a slap in the face of King. And I'm like, no, yeah. you know, actually, Dr. Michael King was for the separation of church and state. It's something people don't even know. 
Well, let me encourage you. You know, I, I have my moments, and this is probably tonight's one of them. When I get, I tend to pop an O-ring <laughs> a little bit. But the absolute uh, truth is people often say, you know, do I ever miss things about... So there are some times when I, I miss the simplicity and comfort of being a believer. But those times are extremely rare. They last for about three seconds. I would never go back. No matter how difficult, no matter how frustrating, yeah. I, my, I find yeah. my life now so much better, so much more fulfilling, so much more awe-inspiring and satisfying, and so much more filled with wonder and gratitude than I ever had when I was a believer. So I know it's not easy for you in Georgia, but be encouraged. You got the good stuff. You probably have come further in. How old are you, may I ask? I am. (laughs) No, 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 you know what? If you you paused, I don't want to know. (laughs) No, 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 no. I'm not listening. I'm not listening. (laughs) I don't want to know, okay? I don't want to know. What, but I'm, what I'm saying is there are people who live, let's say, three times as long as you, and they never get there. And you totally have. And you found your own voice, and I think you're to be commended and celebrated. You're awesome, okay? Thank you so much. You're one of my atheist heroes. Well, no, come on. You and I are all in this together. You We're are. all doing what we can, all right? You so you just keep swinging okay. out there, and I appreciate you. You take care. All right, you too. All right, good night. Thank Bye. you. I can go like a month on one of those kind of calls. It was speaking um, when I spoke in um, Colorado and then in Clearwater. By the way, we have a lot of stuff on the calendar coming up. But people ask me, what's my role? And I'm like, well, I don't know what my role is. But if I had to pin it down, it, you know, it ain't a great thinker. That's not, absolutely not. My role is I'm a storyteller, I'm a producer, but I think mostly I want to be an encourager. I just want to encourage people. There are so many people out there who've been had it pounded into them that they are tainted in some way, or they're doing it wrong, or they're misguided, or they're an embarrassment, or they're a source of shame, or they're this, or they're that. And many of them have nobody in their immediate circle to just look at them and go, look, you are who you are, and I respect that. Even the parts that I don't understand, I celebrate you as an individual. I celebrate the humanist in you. Right? You're seeking real-world solutions to real-world problems. You are taking responsibility for your life and attempting to make for a better world. You're maximizing every moment. You are living it. You're staying true to your conviction. You are living it. And you've earned that right. I celebrate you. There are a lot of folks who, who don't even have that. They got everybody pounding on the front door trying to drag them. When are we going to get you back in church? Look, even if you are going to bring me back to Jesus, I'll give you a hint. One of the worst things you can do is drag my ass to church. Anybody else grow up looking for excuses to get out of having to go to church? And this is back when we had to do slacks and occasionally the... We didn't do... This wasn't a come-as-you-are church. This wasn't, hey, blue jeans and t-shirt and everybody relax. And youth groups look like a, like a concert... That kind of thing. It was, you got to get on your Sunday best and you get up and you go to church. Now we do 30 to 45 minutes of praise and worship. And in Pentecostal church, it can be twice that. And then you get the sermon. Baptist church, they used to have a clock in the back. Noon straight up, the sermon was over and it was time for a quick prayer and everybody goes off to the buffet for lunch. Pentecostal church, that shit can go on till 1.30. The altar calls would just go on and on and on. And you know what? Let's do another stanza. Let's do another stanza. I just know the Lord's working in somebody's life out there tonight. I know somebody out there is wrestling with addiction. Somebody else is wrestling. Somebody else is out there is, is addicted to pornography. I know somebody's out there. Somebody right now is going through an argument with their spouse. They're talking about divorce. I'm talking to you right now. There's somebody out there who's doing this and who's that, suffering from depression. There's somebody out there. Let's do another stanza. They do a stanza. Let's do another stanza. Before you know it, 30 to 45 minutes have passed. People are speaking in tongues. People People are gathered up at the front. There's tears. I don't know how many times they played the same chorus of the same song over and over and over again. I'm a teenage boy. I'm about to come out of my pew. I'm hungry. I'm tired. I want to get out of these uncomfortable clothes. Look, if you want me to come back to Jesus, the worst thing you can do is drag me back to church. Like Jesus doesn't need a building to prove himself to me. He doesn't need some egghead behind a podium 
holding the Bible to prove himself to me. He doesn't need a praise and worship session to prove himself to me. He doesn't need a sermon list. He doesn't need the offering plate. He doesn't need any of that. I don't need the church in the steeple. Right now, he could manifest himself right in front of me. He could solve the mystery. Hi, I'm Jesus. Let's shake. Nice to meet you. Look, here's absolute proof of me. Please follow me and I'll bring you to heaven and we can be together forever. It's real easy. The last thing you need to do is to drag me to church. I have come to the point in my life when I celebrate the ability to sleep in on a Sunday morning. They used to make us feel guilty for that. Oh, I know some of you, some of y'all slept in last week. Some of you went to the football game. Oh. You were at the football house. You need to be at the Lord's house. <laughs> they come up with something like that. Jesus came to earth 2,000 years ago and gave his life for you. You can't give him an hour and a half on a Sunday morning. How obedient are you? I mean, it's just guilt porn. <laughs> it's just nonstop guilt. You slept in on the Lord's day. That's all he wants of you is a little time. I love being an atheist. I get to, I got my Sunday mornings back. Sit back, sleep. I just get up, have my coffee. Baby, you want a coffee? We got nowhere to be. Bring the cat, bring rat dog. We'll chill out on the couch. What's on the television? Let's go sit on the porch when the weather cooperates. Why don't we go out and catch a matinee today? That'll be cool. This is our time. This is our day of rest. We're worshiping at the church of us. <laughs> I mean, the idea of not having to get up and go to... When I was a kid, if we didn't go to church on Sunday mornings, we were forced as children to watch church on television. Now, if there is a hell, it's church on television. Watching the clock, watching that second hand crawl. An hour, it's an hour and a half, Sunday morning, there was a Methodist pastor. His name was Muzon Biggs. I'll never forget him. Boston Avenue Methodist Church had a um, uh, a show they used to broadcast his sermons. We'd watch him. You know, I don't know why we were watching Methodists. We weren't Methodists. Mom was Pentecostal. Dad was more of a conservative Baptist type. They used to watch Robert Schuler's Hour of Power. By the way, Robert Schuler, the Hour of Power, Mr. Success, Mr. Prosperity, Mr. Blessings, bankrupt. Remember the Crystal Cathedral when they built that monstrosity? <laughs> it's, like this, it's like this this monument to excess. The sun's pouring in through the panes of glass to be able to witness God's beauty, the beauty of God's nature. Bankrupt. I think he's even estranged from his own son. His son was poised to carry the mantle to take over the hour of power, and they ended up with a problem, and he kicked his own son out of the church. <laughs> I mean, come on. The hour of power is not really all that powerful, is it? The guy's destitute. Reputations in shambles. You think about all these, all these pez heads, all these crooks, or even even if they're just delusional, all the people who were at the forefront of God's word, God's message, who ended up in disgrace. I was doing some some reading about um, anybody remember Jim and Tammy Faye Baker, right? Heritage USA. It was her, their whole story is a caricature. He gets busted. I think they end up. I don't know how much money they did. They embezzle it. What have people are sending? People are sending them their life savings. Jimmy Swagger, send us your money. He's busted three times with a prostitute. Still on the air. Peter Popoff, the evangelist, gets busted by none other than James Randi with an earpiece in his head. And his wife is feeding him cue card information from backstage, and he's passing it off like he's hearing the voice of God. He's still on the air, and he's still making millions of dollars. It's unbelievable. And so not only when you're watching these people on, on uh, if you're in, in the auditorium, maybe you might get caught up in the moment. I don't know. If you're highly subjective. The idea of watching it on television, God, just, it is a sterile, lifeless slog. We would watch that clock. 
waiting for these evangelists to be done. Kenneth Copeland. <laughs> and all of a sudden, noon would hit, and the show would be over, and you, you saw three kids bust ass out of that room. <laughs> We're done, by Bam! Disappeared! We're off the hook. Oh, man, that takes me back. That takes me back. Josh on Skype, you're on the Thinking Atheist radio podcast. Hi, how you going, Seth? I'm doing well, my friend. What's up? I had to laugh at the topic for today's podcast because I actually went and saw William Lane Craig last night in Brisbane debating Lawrence Krauss. Oh, my goodness. It it was one massive face palm for the whole two hours. It was incredible. How did Krauss do? He's so quick on his feet. Uh, I would think he would do quite well. We were all a bit worried because Krauss isn't so much a debater. Craig talks a big game. And honestly, wait till you see the video. Hopefully they'll put it out on YouTube soonish. Krauss kicked his ass <laughs> big time. It was fantastic. It wasn't a formal debate format. They actually just sat down with the moderator in chairs on the stage and sort of talked back and forth. So every time Craig opened his mouth and said a logical fallacy or, you know, just bullshitted on, Krauss was straight on to him. That's wrong. This is why. It's a logical fallacy. Tore his arguments to pieces. At the end of it, Craig just looked completely frustrated, didn't know what to say. He's just sitting there going, oh, you're wrong, Mr. Krauss. You're wrong, you know. It was magic. I hope they do post that online somewhere. Well, yeah, no, well, we know they had cameras there, so we're hoping they'll uh, put it on YouTube at some point. Yeah, I saw him uh, but, do a, they did a, a show, oh, I can't, I'm off the, off the cuff, I can't remember the name of the show, but they had him on uh, some major network and they brought him on. And it was a John Stossel interview of some kind, I believe, and they were talking about Does God Exist? And and Krauss did quite well. He's pretty quick. And, and obviously, if you're William Lane Craig and you're going to be start talking about the origins of the universe, well... You don't want Lawrence Krauss sitting across the table from you, you know? Exactly, and he tried it. And we're just sitting there going, you idiot. And it was basically, you know, he's he's the cosmological element. Oh, look at the universe. It looks big and complex, therefore God. You don't look at Lawrence Krauss. Well, this is what we know. You don't say, how can something come from nothing to the guy who authored the book, A Universe from Nothing? You just, it's not a good idea. Exactly. You know, well, that's cr- going to be the next debate topic they have in two weeks' time in Sydney. is going to be about nothing. So that will be interesting. Craig's one of those yeah, guys. Craig, you know, uh, he says, you know, like you, you can't have um, objective morality without God. Therefore, because objective morals exist. Exactly and what God he said exists. last night. That kind of. Did he, did he pull some of that last night? Where do you get your morals from? Oh, he was pulling the, uh, pulling out that argument that you can't have morals without God, which is just crap. His big one, he was asked about the Canaanites killing the, the children or something, or the Canaanite children being killed. And he, basically his argument was, well, you know, God created everyone, and including the children, so it's, he's allowed to uh, kill the children because he takes them up to a nice, happy, <laughs> eternal place of heaven. And we're all just sitting in the audience going, yeah. my God. Yeah. Are you kidding us? The whole crowd. There was probably about 2,000 people there last night. It was a big crowd. Wow. And it was quite funny. After the debate, they did book signing and stuff, which was great. We got got to go and meet him and get some photos and stuff. But it was telling that it was like a 30-minute wait to get your book signed with Krauss, and the line was almost out the door. With William Lane Craig, I think he left after 20 minutes because (laughs) there was no one lining up (laughs) to the point. Because we, we all wanted to go across and get our Universe from Nothing book signed by Craig as well. <laughs> oh, that's awesome art. to get Krauss's book signed by William Lane Craig. That's classic. Yeah, well, there was, we were going to do that, and a few people did, but we were waiting in line, and we're just about to Krauss, and then I've looked over, and Craig's gone. And I said to my mates, look, he's either gone, or maybe he's been raptured. <laughs> <Yeah>. So... <laughs> But well, I'll have to give you, have, before I finish, I'll have to give you the best quote of the entire night because Craig was just going on about philosophy and how philosophy and theology are so important and they'll, they'll give us all the answers and all this stuff. And Krauss just turned around to him and was fed up because he, he was very tired after a 20-hour flight. And he just looked at Craig with disdain and said, look, you go over there and discuss theology and philosophy with your lot and we scientists... We'll be over here figuring out how the universe works. 
and the whole crowd just lost it. We were just up applauding, and oh, it was a good night, a good night. But I yeah, can't Craig, get a beat William Lane Craig. Craig. Uh, I mean, do you think he's? Do you think he really believes it, or do you think he's out there selling the Craig brand for a buck? Do you think he's for real? We were discussing that on the way home. I think he believes it. I really do. Just watching the way he spoke and the way he his con- sort of conviction. If he doesn't believe it, he's certainly a very good actor. Yeah. But I think he because I was asking, what do you think would change your mind and blah blah blah, and he was saying, you know, oh, I haven't seen any evidence that there isn't a god and blah. But I think I think you know Ray Comfort I think is full of shit, and it's just at this point he's just playing for cash. William Lane Craig, I think genuinely believes what he does and it's unfortunate for him he seems like actually a nice guy when he's not talking about god yeah you know he was quite pleasant he was very you know he's having a laugh and all that and you know but yeah i think he i think he does i think he believes what he's saying i find myself and a lot of the people the skeptic in me looks at somebody like like i look at can't Hoven, and I'm like, he can't buy this. You know, I'm with you on comfort. Like Ray Comfort, I think he's just in too deep to get out, and he's selling something. Kirk Cameron, he didn't make it as an actor, so now he's an evangelist. People are talking about him. I, I'm not convinced. I, who really knows what's happening in their mind and heart? But I'm not convinced he's necessarily the real. De- I don't know, but there are some people out there who just honestly believe they are fighting the good fight, and maybe William Lane Craig is yeah. one of those guys. So I think he is. Well, it's good to hear your voice, my friend. All right, mate. We'll catch up with you soon. Take it easy. Let's do one more before we call it a night. Area code 785. You're on the Thinking Atheist radio podcast. Who's this? Uh, my name is Unholy Roller. Um, I'm not going to give you my real name because of the uh, nature of my employment. One moment. Let me turn down my radio. Please. That's fine. You can call yourself whatever you like. Unholy Roller works for me. Thank you, Seth. Well, um... Had a broken record, I want to get off my chest. I happen to be disabled. I'm in a wheelchair. I've been an atheist for about 20 years or so. And one thing that I get really tired of hearing from theists is either that God made me special or that I'm an atheist simply because I'm angry because I feel like he put me in a wheelchair. So they see what happened to you is, were you, may I ask, was it an accident or was it uh, some kind yeah, of... Yeah, it was an accident at birth. Okay. So they say, this happened to you and now you're lashing out. Exactly. Which is a and huge really attempt to marginalize you, right? If you come... So you probably, what, present the logical reasons that you came to the conclusion that you came, right? Well, you probably tell them, well, here's what the facts are, but they can't get past the well, fact that you're in a wheelchair. Right, right, exactly. Now, I will be honest, I had a very bad experience with a faith healer when I was a child, oh. but that didn't turn me into an atheist. It, uh, you know, planted some seed. But yeah, I basically... Uh, you know, turn my back on the whole God thing because it just, you know, without going into any deep, any, a lot of detail, you know, because I know you have a lot of callers, but, you know, it just didn't make any sense to me. Can I ask you about the faith here? We did a show on this, and this is an, along with the indoctrination of children. The phenomenon of the faith healer is a real hot button for me, right? They bring these right. people up. They give them hope that God's going to come and bring them wholeness and healing and wellness and a complete whole body. And usually, you know, there might be an offering plate involved. I don't really know. It depends on the service. Would they drag you up front and lay hands on you? Can I ask you about well, the experience? Yeah, basically what happened, and I'll try to be as brief as I can, because I know you've only got no, about no, 30 minutes. Take your left. time, man. Take your time. Okay, Tell me about thank it. you. I appreciate it. Uh, just, just a second, please. I'm, I'm, I'm a little nervous. I've never talked to you before, so I just no, wanted don't to kind of compose awesome. myself a little bit. Um, I've been a big fan of the show for a long time, and actually, um, I'm on your friends page and your Facebook page, but I don't want to give my name right now. That's all right. Uh, but anyway, when I was about eight, I mean, my parents weren't real religious or anything. I mean, they didn't force anything on me. I mean, they believed in God, but we never went to church or anything. And uh, they had basically decided to let me make my own mind up about religion, which in some ways is both good and bad. And basically what happened was my neighbor's sister told my mother that she had a vision of Jesus that had come to her, and Jesus had said that he had healed me. 
and that I went and that I needed to go to these revival services that evening. And my mother asked me if I wanted to go, and I told her, yeah. Um, I don't think she should have let me, but yeah. everybody has twenty twenty hindsight, I guess. And basically what happened was they dragged me up there, and I get on the stage and everything, and they've got the music and the, the hallelujahs and, and all that shit going on. And uh, I tried to take a step out of my wheelchair, and I fall off the stage. And so what were your expectations? I was totally convinced that Jesus was going to heal me. And when Jesus did not heal you, what happened? Well, I won't say, well, as you know, you know, becoming an atheist or rediscovering your atheism, as I like to put it, is sort of a gradual process. So I can't say that's what turned me into an atheist, but it planted some seeds. Yeah, if they come and they and, promise divine healing, right? A supernatural work. Right. God still you know, performs and, miracles today, that kind of you thing. Know, yeah, and for a long time, you know, you know, I wrestled, you know, why didn't God heal me? You know, it sort of turned into the same argument as the whole problem of evil thing. Yeah. You know, we, we just don't know, you know, his ways are higher than our ways and all that happy horse shit. Well, and they get a pass. I mean, you know, it wasn't God's timing if you're not healed, or maybe you didn't have enough faith, or maybe he's going to heal right. you later. Yeah I, yeah, I didn't have enough faith. That was something else that I got. And I didn't really rediscover my atheism until about 20 years ago. Hmm. Uh, but that, that was a seed there, you know, that was planted. And, um, and I'm just really fucking tired. Pardon my language. You're I'm fine. just really tired of hearing. I'm just really tired of hearing, you know, well... You're just angry at God because you're in a wheelchair, which, by the way, um, when one of the Phelps has said that to me, I'm originally from Topeka, Kansas, I spit in their face. So, well, wait a minute. One of the Phelps is like the Westboro Phelpses? Yes. They said yes, to you, I'm the reason that you're in a wheelchair is because why? She said God put you in that wheelchair. Oh. Oh, man. But yeah, we're, well, I spit on her glasses, but man. that's getting way off topic. Well, it, but, look, but any, there, you know, you honestly tested the promises of religion, right? Religion made a claim, and your condition allowed you to test that claim. I wanted more than anything to believe. And you came away and you thought they were wrong. Nothing happened. Everything that's happening around me is a cause and effect thing. It can all be explained naturally. So even if you being in a wheelchair in some way was part of the overall conversation for you, mm -hmm. it's a legitimate part of the conversation. It's a legitimate right. part of that exploration into what is true, what is mm -hmm. not true, what can be supported, what cannot. And right. uh, I mean, how you doing? Are are you are you the angry, pissed off atheist? <laughs> are you? I mean, you uh, probably carry some of that yeah, with yeah. you, right? Uh, it depends on who you ask. I usually, um, I usually, yeah, on the internet, I usually go by the name of Unholy Roller. Yeah. You know, atheist in a wheelchair type thing, because like I just said, I don't, I've got to be careful because of where I work. I get that. You know, and play it as close to the chest as you need to, especially on the internet. You just never know who's watching. I right. have had people who have, who have lost careers because they were on Facebook and said something. It's, oh, I, I've lost a couple jobs because of it. Yeah. So, I get it. I mean, I, nobody judges you for using an alias. Yeah, I know you do. So as long as you're part of the conversation, too. I mean, one thing about the Internet is by being able to have a handle. I have people who will create multiple accounts. They have one account they use for mom and dad and the employer, but they're so right. desperate to be a part of community or at least a, a conversation out there, they have another account and they'll mm -hmm. log on and they can go and be who they need to be. <laughs> you know? so. Yeah. Well, I don't hide anything on Facebook. Yeah. You know, I, I, I use my name. I put up... You know, I, I make no bones about who and what I am. And I think, honestly, because of political correctness, because of the fact that I'm a gimp in a wheelchair, um, you know, people are afraid to, uh, you know, attack me or stand up to me, for lack of a better term. Yeah. Which I think I could use to my advantage, actually, you know, as far as, uh, you know, getting my message out there, for lack of a better word for it. Well, you but, know, uh, I hope this doesn't sound like a cliche, but, you know, your body in some way may be restrained, but there are no restraints on right. your mind, on your intellect, on your ability to choose. And that's something I'm... Oh, I have a year of law school under my belt. I'm sorry, I missed it. Could you say it again for me? I have a year of law school under my belt. 
law school. Good for you. So, all right. But uh, go ahead, sir. No, go ahead. I'm just I'm following your lead right well, now. It, You're doing great. Well, also, when I, you know, I just wanted to uh, get those two broken records off my chest, or maybe those were <laughs> two different sides of the same broken record. But I just really wish people would stop saying that to me. Yeah. yeah. And honestly, another thing that I was thinking about when I was sitting here listening is I think. You know, you get frustrated, and, you know, why do we bother? And there's all these stupid people, you know, spreading these same arguments that haven't changed for, you know, since, you know, the origin of species came out or whatever. But I really do believe that if we can f- survive long enough as a species, that we will prevail. I have no doubt. I really do think it will not be, the facts will not be repressed, no matter how crazy it gets, no matter how insane the conversation sometimes feels. Uh, I think one of the reasons mm-hmm. that despite our frustrations, we keep kicking is because we think you know, mm-hmm. the, the truth, especially in the age of the internet of information of, of such amazing scientific discovery, there's no mm-hmm. way that the facts will be repressed and the truth is going to get out there. And, and I think it's going to forgive the expression, set a whole lot of people free. Thanks again. And, um, yeah, I was I was just gonna say too. I think another another thing that points to the fact that we will win is that I've been an atheist since the early '90s, and when I first got on the internet, I mean there was the infidel guy and atheist network radio, you know, and uh, Dillahunty and some of those other people, and that was it. And now there's stuff all over the place. So awesome. we will win if we survive long enough. And I would like to thank you for taking my call. All right, take care of yourself, my friend. We'll see you later. Later, man. All right. The Unholy Roller. It sounds like a movie, you know, in a world (laughs) of the Unholy Roller. By the way, I mentioned that there's a lot of events coming up. Um, The easiest thing for you to do, and I really hope that you'll consider if these events are coming to the area that that the region you live in or, or... or you can make it to some of these, that you support them. You know, there are so many on the calendar right now. I'm, I fear a little bit that that um, yeah, I'm hoping overexposure is not a problem. But there's nothing like getting together with a group of people who get you. And uh, I love the opportunity to be able to shake the hands and give hugs to people who have been such an amazing support system in my life. And that is you. And uh, so just very quickly, I will tell you that the weekend of uh, August 30th, which is Labor Day weekend, is the Atheist Alliance of America National Convention. That's going to be in the Boston area. And it's, it's going to be major. It's going to be a major. Uh, Dr. Andy Thompson's there. Uh, Miriam Namazi is going to be there. Dr. Steven Pinker. Um, the uh, Pennsylvania Atheist Humanist Convention is happening the weekend of the 13th. Jerry DeWitt's going to be there. J.T. Eberhard, he was a recent guest on our show. Jamila Bay, by the way, I'm having her on, I think, in September. I'm working on it. Um, Aposticon is on the 20th of September in Omaha. Uh, Florida Freethought Conference, the weekend of November 2nd. James Randi, I mean, I'm so there. Uh, Dave Silverman, Nate Phelps, Daryl Ray is going to be there. Uh, Teresa McBain. Uh, a whole lot of great stuff. Skepticons coming up in mid-November on the weekend of the 15th. Just a lot of good stuff on the calendar. That's going to be in Springfield. And you can see those listed on my website. Just go to thethinkingatheist.com slash tour, and they should all be listed there with links and registration info. It's a whole lot. It's, it's, it's a lot to take in. But it, it's exciting. It's exciting to see this sort of uh, surge of free thought events and people coming together to support each other and exchange ideas and challenge each other and make memories and make friends. And it's it's everything I say it is and a whole lot more. If you haven't been to one of these things, trust me, I saw some people in Denver and they were like, this is the first conference I've ever been to like this. And it's awesome. I mean, it was it, to be surrounded by hundreds and hundreds of people who who celebrate reason, who celebrate the fight against indoctrination of children, who who celebrate human rights, right? Not just heterosexual human rights, but human rights. I mean, it's amazing how the non-belief in God spills over into so many other areas of your life. And it really has ignited for many of us uh, an awe and passion for discovering and living in the real world, the world as it is, not as some mythology paints it to be. And so uh, I feed off of these events. They they certainly take a lot of, uh, of out of the schedule. I was looking at the schedule. I'm a little overwhelmed by it. But the truth is, once I get off the plane, I get a chance 
to be there. There's just nothing like it. And if you haven't done one, you really, really, really should go. Okay, thethinkingatheist.com slash tour is the website. Thank you so much for enduring my rant tonight. Kind of a long monologue of me just totally unprepared, just blowing smoke. I appreciate you putting up with it, okay? And thank you for that. If you have a podcast topic suggestion, I'd like to talk about the things that are on your mind. Some of the things that are sort of ringing your bell these days. If you have an idea, why don't you shoot me an email? Podcast at thethinkingatheist.com. Take care of yourself. Have a wonderful week. And I'll see you next time. Follow The Thinking Atheist on Facebook and Twitter. Watch dozens of original videos on The Thinking Atheist YouTube channel. And visit our website for resources, links, contact information, the editor's blog, and more. TheThinkingAtheist.com